This is an i3-12100F. The F means drop an F in chat because it doesn't have integrated graphics. The 12 means it's a 12th generation processor, so it supports DDR5, and the i3 means it's at the bottom of Intel's product stack. So I didn't spend a lot of money on it. This is a $100 processor. And I bought this system, I bought this processor to go into a $600 gaming PC that I'm building. So and I wanted to just because this processor, this i3 and my i7 that I have in my main rig, both share the same socket. So I wondered what would happen if I took the i7 out of my rig and replaced it with an i3. Would it do everything the same? Would it run all the games I wanted it to run? Well, let's find out. So I swapped it, and for our benchmarks that we're going to be running today, I have 32 gigs of DDR5 at 5600 megahertz. The i3 took that XMP profile like a champ and actually had less crashing issues with the i3 than I normally do the i7, which is totally bonkers. There's an RTX 3080 12 gig in here, an Asus ROG Strix B660i, a 240mm AIO. This is, for all intents and purposes, a relatively high-end system. The system is spec'd high enough that it should let both CPUs out to their full potential. Hopefully we don't run into GPU bottlenecking with either of these CPUs, but let's see what both these CPUs can do. Well, putting this i3 into my system just felt wrong. The cooler costs more than the CPU, but okay, how did it do in benchmarks? So I picked four different games to benchmark, not the most graphically intensive games on the planet because I wanted the CPUs to be doing a fair bit of the work just to kind of emphasize the difference on the two. So we've got Red Dead Redemption 2, Cyberpunk 2077, Call of Duty Cold War, and Fortnite. So how do we do in Red Dead Redemption 2? Well, in RDR 2 at 4K, the i3 and the i7 were within a single frame per second of each other, and at 1440p, the gap grew from less than one frame per second on average to about three. And at 1080p, three grew to 12. Now, granted, we're not talking the difference between, you know, 30 and 45 FPS. We're talking the difference between 123 and 135. If you put these two systems side by side to each other, I would not and could not tell you the difference. This i3 kept up pretty good in this game. Well, how about Cyberpunk 2077? Surely the newer title would be able to take advantage of the higher core count in the i7, right? Well, using the default ultra settings again with ray tracing and DLSS turned off at 4K, the i3 actually paced out the i7 by less than a frame. Being less than one frame off is more margin of error than anything. So at 4K and 1440p, they basically played identically. I could not have told you the difference again. And at 1080p, the i7 pulled ahead by roughly 10 frames per second again. So not a whole lot. When we tried Cold War, Next, to see if, you know, maybe a lighter title would pull the i7 ahead a little further than the i3. I was correct at 4K using the default ultra settings again, and the i3 scored 62 FPS while the i7 scored 68. So we're up from a 3 frame per second difference to 6. While at 1440p, the opposite was true. The i3 actually pulled 120 FPS why the, why the i7 pulled 102. Just goes to show what a difference between runs can do and between maps. I reran the 1440 test a few times and kept getting the same result. It was actually kind of strange. But at 1080p, the i7 finally pulled a decent lead and scored 60 FPS, while the i3, or I'm sorry, the i7 pulled 
180 FPS, while the i3 pulled 140. So we finally got a 25% difference. However, that was at you know, a very e-sportsy resolution. In Fortnite, the story was much of the same as it was with Cold War, with the difference at 4K being margin of error, growing to 1080p being an actual difference of 40 FPS. This doesn't make any sense that a $100 CPU can keep up with a $400 CPU. So why is this happening? So the i3 is a 4-core, 8-thread chip clocked at 3.3 gigahertz base and a 4.3 gigahertz boost. The i7 is a 12-core, 20-thread chip at 3.6 base and 4.9 boost for the P-cores. So you would think that the i7 would absolutely destroy the i3 in any task known to man because not only is it faster per core, it also has literally double the cores with an old i7 strapped to its sidecar style for background tasks. But that doesn't tell the whole story. The i3 and the i7 are both the same CPU, essentially. The, the cores and the architecture, it's all the exact same. The i3 is just cut down so it has less cores. When they make these processors, it's a silicone binning process. The higher quality silicone, still the same architecture as a lower quality, just the higher quality makes it into being i7s, lower quality makes it into being i3s. So, if you were to, you know, take a task like gaming, for example, that only uses four or six threads when you're playing it, the i3 and the i7 are similar enough in clock speed and IPC or instructions per clock that the performance would be roughly the same because you're not actually needing to, nor can you use, more CPU than the i3 has, at least for now. So yes, an i3 is plenty enough for gaming. At least this i3 is, and will keep up in games with a CPU that costs roughly four times as much. Now, if you do something other than gaming, like video editing like I do, your timeline performance will suffer, and so will your render time by running the i3 as opposed to the i7. But if all you're doing is gaming and you're focused more toward 4K gaming, because there is a difference at lower resolutions, the faster processor does have a faster core clock so it can keep up with the graphics card at higher frame rates. But if you're primarily focused on 4K gaming or budget gaming, all you really need is an i3. Anyway, if you made it to this point in the video, thanks for watching. I hope you found it useful. If you did, don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe for next week's video. We're starting a PS2 emulator console project while we wait for parts on the $600 PC. See you guys in the next one.